Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the 2024 Global PAD Impact Awards, where we celebrate the remarkable individuals driving change in the fight against peripheral artery disease. Now, today, we are thrilled to introduce the Vascular Luminary of the Year Award, honoring a doctor whose work has truly transformed our understanding and treatment of PAD. This year's recipient is a visionary leader who has galvanized a team of researchers to create groundbreaking evidence on critical, critical aspects of PAD care. His work emphasizes the transformative power of lifestyle modifications, including the important concept of walking as medicine, which has shown significant benefits in preventing PAD and reducing amputations. Additionally, his research on intravascular ultrasound, or IVIS, as an impactful imaging tool has provided new insights, influencing clinical practices and improving patient care across the globe. Now, one of the most powerful pieces of research he worked on helped paint the grim picture of that real cause of the amputation epidemic in this country that's related to PAD, which is the lack of vascular assessment and treatment prior to amputation. That research stands to have a profound impact on policy, which may lead to better care for people with PAD. Now, beyond his research, he is a passionate advocate for raising awareness and educating both the medical community and the public about PAD through the Pulse on PAD campaign and other initiatives. He also is an incredible mentor for the next generation, fostering interdisciplinary collaboration. What's that word? Collaboration. All of the above underscores his dedication to advancing the field and improving patient outcomes. So it is with great pleasure that we present the Vascular Luminary of the Year Award to interventional cardiologist, Dr. Eric Szymski. Congratulations, Dr. Szymski, on this well-deserved honor. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Those very kind words, and I appreciate uh, the opportunity to accept this award. We just appreciate everything that you do to try and improve uh, care for patients with peripheral artery disease. You know, first, tell us a little bit about your practice, your who you are, and why are you just so passionate about legs? Why do you have a foot fetish? <laughs> I love that. I always tell my trainees when they come to clinic with me that they're going to spend more time with feet than they ever thought they would. So, um, <laughs> you know, and then I have a little bit of a unique background because for the interventional cardiologist, you know, we... Um, spend a lot of our time in other conditions, as you know, as cardiology training. And so, yeah. you know, I have, I came into the vascular space with really not knowing when I started that this would where I'd or I'd you know really specialize my time. And so, you know, when just to remind everyone when you're going through your your training programs, you make these key decisions out of med school. You have to decide if you're going to be a surgeon or a non-surgeon. That's kind of the first bifurcation. And I chose, you know, to be an internist. And then at that point, you have to decide within internal medicine, do you want to do just that or cardiologist or gastroenterology? So I want to be a cardiologist. My dad was a cardiologist. I was passionate about cardiovascular disease. Um, and I did my training in cardiology. And then you decide again, do you want to stop here? You want to be a proceduralist? I said, you know what? I really like using my hands. I like being able to, to deliver the final care to my patient. I want to be an interventionist. So I decided to be an interventionist. And then the most important part of my career um, came about, which was, how do I want to be an interventionist? You know, and, and the one thing that we haven't done a great job of as a field in cardiology is building in more vascular training early on. Yeah. So I get a lot of interventional cardiologists and even cardiologists who are um, impressed with how much time I spend in the vascular space versus um, the other areas that I trained in. And so in interventional cardiology, I decided to do a, a focused year um, only in vascular medicine and interventional card and vascular intervention. So I'd already done my interventional coronary training. So we treat heart attacks and whatnot, but all I did was vascular medicine and peripheral vascular interventions. And from there in 2018, I went and started my own, um, interventional program at a sister hospital in Boston, another Harvard hospital. And, you know, over the years, my practice now has gone from some cardiology, some vascular to almost all vascular. So, I have a outpatient clinic that is only peripheral artery disease. Um, my um, interventional procedures are split between only vascular interventions, and then I do some coronary intervention still and take um, heart attack call, but also vascular call. And then my research is almost only focused on peripheral vascular disorders at this time. And so, you know, really it's shaped um, 
my own career falling into this uh, foot fetish, as you may, <laughs> um, and and really, you know, dedicating all aspects of what I do in my day to day on um, really trying to conquer peripheral vascular disorders. What was the impetus for really getting into the research side of things? Because you are so much more involved than most interventional cardiologists, interventional cardiologists or other vascular doctors in this space. Was there a particular question that that you sought to solve or a particular gap? that really was that catalyst for driving you into this field? Yeah, you know, it's a great question. And, you know, I get a lot of, um, you know, trainees, even even more mature doctors who reach out and ask about how do you um, dedicate, you know, part of your career to, to the academic portion and the research. Um, and, you know, for me, I kind of fell into it in medical school. I've been doing some cardiology research um, and it wasn't focused on vascular disease, but I kind of continued it in my residency program, and I realized I really liked the academic research component to um, that uh, career, academic career. And so I knew when I was um, looking for my next level of training, my cardiology training and so on, that I needed a program that could support me, um, you know, really diving into the academic side and building out the research program. And I went to Massachusetts General Hospital, Harvard, and I did um, two years of only research. So not a lot of people do that. I had to take off time and get funding, but I did two years where all I did was a postdoctorate in research, um, and I did a master's degree at the Harvard School of Public Health in, in biostatistics and epidemiology. And, You've been busy. And, yeah, I was busy, and, and that was before two years back doing interventional vascular. But but during that wow. time, I figured out two things. One was um, I've been working with my mentors, Bobby Ye, um, as well as uh, Laura Mori, who's um, now the chief medical officer at Medtronic. And you know, we had been working with how do we take trial data and make trial data a little bit more um, patient focused. So trying to make decision tools for patients to um, understand maybe a little bit more information about procedures being offered to them, a little bit more about the risks and benefits of a therapy. And then I kind of fell in love with vascular. I, Kenny Rosenfeld um, was my mentor. He's a very well-known interventional vascular cardiologist. And he got me exposed to the disease state. And then I stepped back and I looked at the research behind it. And I said, you know, there's a lot that's lacking, you know, in the coronary and cardiology, we have 10, 20,000 person trials. We have guidelines and algorithms for everything. And it's really helped our career advance. And when I look at vascular, we've got trials that are either not done or there are 20 people or 50 people. And if we're lucky, a couple hundred, we don't have really algorithms that are adopted across the board. So specialties do things differently. And even people within my own specialty do things differently. And we needed some more foundational uh, research to push, you know, our regulatory bodies, push forward the funding, push forward um, the awareness campaigns. And so, you know, I, I thought that, you know, between my interest in this disease state and my ability to make an impact, hopefully throughout my career that, I wanted to really focus on a disease state that was important to me, and that was peripheral artery disease and vascular disorders overall. And I love that you're not just focusing on, on the plumbing. Your work has truly emphasized the concept of walking as medicine, as a preventative measure, and also a measure of management and prevention of amputation. Can you explain how this lifestyle modification can prevent PAD and reduce amputations? Now, I realize this is a little rhetorical, but I want to hear your words. Yeah, no, that's an important question. I know me and you share this passion, with, which makes me only, you know, care so much more about the work that you do. And, you know, I, I always tell my patients and my my partners and refers that I'm a conservative interventionist. So I love doing procedures, but I love doing them when I know it's there's a clear cut right decision to do them. And I love being able to talk to patients about alternative treatment options when those are a possibility as well. And my um, NIH award, my award from the National Institute of Health was on exactly the shared decision making and how do we make thoughtful decisions. And when you look at the data and exactly to your point, Kim, you know, there is so much that um, we could have done before PAD becomes symptomatic PAD or critical limb ischemia, chronic limb threatening ischemia. You know, we have we have if we get to the point where a patient is being admitted with an ulcer on their foot, we miss 10 to 20 years of preventative care and interventions that could have, you know, kept that from happening. And so, you know, as you mentioned, we put out a paper earlier this year that looked at angiograms before a major amputation. And that's a really important, you know, opportunity to hopefully delay an amputation if we can get the right limb salvage specialist in front of that patient. But, you know, again, we also did work 
looking at some disparities in care for patients, such as minority patients or those who might self-identify as Black Americans or Hispanic Americans. And we found that these patients come in with much worse comorbidities, more severe disease states, and are likely not getting enough access to the preventative care that's necessary before developing this end-stage terminal illness. And so, you know, I think, you know, the biggest move forward in the vascular space is going to find a way to get better access for at-risk patients, so diabetics, those who have a family history, those who've had a smoking history or other major comorbidities, make sure we're identifying them, optimizing their medical therapy, doing anything we can to encourage activity, smoking sensation, all the good habits that we preach as cardiologists. And, you know, I would love to see my, my interventional practice diminish because more patients are protecting their limbs and staying out of the procedure lab. And so that's an absolute mission of mine. And I know we, we share that deeply together. Yeah, wouldn't you just love most of your conversations that you have with your patients just be about the excitement they have with the progress they've made and taking just one more step and one more step and suddenly they're out of rest pain and suddenly they're out of this lifestyle limiting claudication and they're able to live a better quality of life just through walking as medicine alone, just through um, smoking cessation, just through eating a better diet and complying with their medicines. We see this every day. I just end up ended up with a, a message from one of your your colleagues, is uh, Dr. Anida Duwa. Um, a patient watched a video that she did on on how to walk effectively to grow the collateral vessels. And we have a community support group. And over the past year, this patient went from literally he, he could not walk to his mailbox, and he decided because of the messaging that we have in our groups that, you know what, I see other patients doing this. So I'm going to do it too. And he started walking and he just messaged me yesterday saying that he made it seven miles yesterday. Wow. Whoa. Wow. That's, Stop. that's competing with me. I think now <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty good. Maybe not walking as fast as you. Oh, I'll take it though. That's it. motivation right there. Was that crazy? I couldn't yeah. believe it. I was really blown away. And he said he had so he is so thankful because he has not begun this revolving door of treatment. He's it's a revolving door of walking, and he realizes that he has to keep taking those steps to maintain. But what an accomplishment! What a feeling of empowerment that we were able to give this patient. And I would imagine your practice, you being able to do this every day versus having to intervene, that would feel pretty good. <laughs> yeah. Well, again, it, it's. It's also really nice to be at that state where you're walking seven miles and your job now is to maintain it. Because we know, always know getting there is the sometimes uh, the hardest part. And so I, I think we all celebrate when we are, you know, two, three weeks, then two, three months, then two, three years into our exercise consistency program and being like, wow, I can do this and maintain it, you know, and, and that first ramp up here, it's the hardest, but that's a proud moment for that patient. And uh, I share all those uh, enjoy some of those milestones with my patients. Uh, I love it. And I love, I know they love it too. And before we get into other aspects of, of your research, which I know we want to get to, which are incredibly important as well. Tell us a little bit more. You have now six supervised exercise therapy programs that probably, um, you know, really stemmed for that, from that initial research and the proof that you, that you had in that research um, that walking as medicine truly works. Can you talk about some of the statistics of walking as medicine, why it works, how it works? Yeah, great question. So I joined, and I, I mentioned before, I started my interventional vascular interventional practice in particular, and we started vascular medicine section at my hospital in 2018. And when we got there, one thing that was really frustrating for me is I'd get patients referred to me or I see online and everyone would make a comment like, oh, don't don't fix that lesion. They should go for exercise. They just need to be exercising. And I'd see a consult note with another specialist and they'd say, recommend exercise at home. But there was zero guidance. There was no instruction. It was just a, hey, you should stop smoking and exercise. Thanks for coming into the clinic today. And, you know, maybe we'll see you in a year. And so I, I my partner, Brett Carroll, and I, we knew that was not going to be an effective strategy. And you know, reimbursement came in 2017 for exercise programs through Medicare. And so we um, looked at it. We, the first brain, the, the best idea I had to start was we found this um, kind of, we have this little like urgent clinic on the first floor of a hospital and there's a, a room with a treadmill in it. So I was like, you know what? I'm like, Brad, maybe I'll just come in three days a week in the morning and I'm just going to sit there and do some work and have people exercise and I'll walk them through it myself. 
and we'll see what happens. And then, you know, hopefully we can grow it. And that was my first idea. And I went to leadership and I said, can I use this treadmill in a room? Um, and then we got a little smarter and we got some people involved who said, well, listen, if you're willing to spend your time sitting there doing this three times a week, maybe we can help you. And we found out that we had um, about six physical therapy centers around our main institution. And we got our physical lead physical therapists uh, together and we said, let us go out and train all the, all the physical therapists to do exercise therapy. Mm -hmm. So we went to each of the sites um, and we brought materials with to help them get comfortable with the program, um, the disease state. We would see all the patients beforehand, refer them. As I mentioned, we track their outcomes through a, a questionnaire and then we see them back in clinic. And so um, that ended up being a wonderful um, and prolific uh, opportunity because we all of a sudden went from having no research program or set, uh, sorry, exercise programs to six ones in and around Boston. Um, and we got all these people who were writing, exercising your note. Now we had them referred to us. And the other thing that was really important there was we would, we mandated that they see us once in clinic only because we're cardiologists and we do a lot with the medications, statins and blood cholesterol and antiplatelets. So it was an opportunity for us also to make sure because we know people in this state are not always on the right medication or any of the right medications. And so we would make sure they're on every medication that is guideline recommended recommended at the same time as screening them for the exercise program. So we still have this, you know, we're seven, uh, what are we, seven years running now, almost seven years now. Um, we've got a very busy program. But, you know, the research that I had done also beforehand, one of the papers we've published, and we just did an update on this, was looking at how often do people with claudication, so that's the main indication for exercise program, um, actually do it. And we looked in the, the data set of Medicare. So we looked at everybody who has Medicare. And all we can find was about one and a half percent of patients who have claudication were actually doing exercise programs. And the majority of those weren't even completing the full, you know, three month, you can do up to six months, but three month um, programs. And so we did that a few years ago. And just last month, we went and we updated that data. We said, are we doing any better now? We know COVID probably slowed things down, but we've been a few years now outside of the main uh, pandemic. And we looked at those numbers again, and they weren't much better. And that was published just recently in vascular medicine. And so, you know, I think to your charge, Kim, and, and you know, this conversation is, you know, there's still a lot of centers who say we don't have anywhere to send these people for exercise programs. And we just tell them, to exercise at home or on their own. And so, you know, as you build out initiatives for more home-based exercise programs for people who either don't have them or they don't have the time because they work. Um, and then for our side also, we need to keep building out this awareness and um, the, you know, investment into these centers and showing pragmatic ways like physical therapy groups to make it happen, I think will be the only way to solve this issue. I really don't understand, and maybe you can explain it to me because it seems maybe you'd be uh, kind of baffled by this as well. The OEIS endorsed our walking program because it's at no cost to physicians, it's at no cost to patients, and they can be as involved as they want or they don't have to, and we just manage it for them. No big deal. And we have literally had a dozen doctors sign up. That's it. We have nearly 600 patients. Most of our patients actually come through um, our network of 12,000 patients that we are now enrolling and enrolling and enrolling because their doctors, again, send them home, tell them to stop smoking, tell them to eat better and tell them to walk. And there's no other guidance to give, but this is there. This is free. They know many know about it, but they don't sign up. And I don't understand what prevents them from signing up when this is the most, the most, I think important thing that a patient can do to improve their prognosis. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, there's, there's some disconnect uh, and I don't know exactly how to explain it all. You know, I, I think that physicians are busy as we know, and that's not an excuse. Patients are busy as well. And that's not an excuse. And it's a, you know, class one indication in the guidelines. I was part of the guideline running committee. We've been uh, class very one. protective of that. And so, you know, I, I wish I had an easy answer for you. I think my job, job and part of the guidelines job um, was to make this really clear. It's the highest recommended level of evidence. And mm -hmm. as we get into more and more challenges with, you know, the insurance companies trying to protect you know, too many interventions and appropriate use, you know, the best way for us to grow this space and protect it and invest in it is to make sure that everybody's doing what they can, including exercise before being referred for a procedure. 
And if we're lucky to get the exercise program successful, like the patient you just shared with me, Kim, like then everybody wins. The insurance companies are happy to cover the procedure when patients need it. Patients win because they have an alternative to an invasive treatment um, that they can do on their own and be successful with, and they can improve their global cardiovascular health. So, you know, we just need to keep getting the word out. And I appreciate again, everything you're doing and everyone um, involved in the organization, because we need a grassroots ground up approach and that's what you're doing. And um, we, I would love to hear, and I know there are several people that are on here in our live studio audience, as well as I can see watching online that all want to know how you would actually guide a patient to walk more effectively to grow their collateral vessels. I can share with you what I'm saying. So it gives you something to refute. Yeah, well, I'd love to hear your approach to start, Kim. Yeah. I don't know on the spot, right? You know, I, I learned from Anita Dua, which is maybe what she does. And I always tell patients that they have to, you know, walk until they feel the pain. They mark down that they're pain. But what we want them to do at that point is they need to walk through the pain and they need to walk through that pain in order to actually grow that those their collateral vessels. That's when your body just jumps into action and they need to walk through to the point that they're gonna cry. And then they stop. If they think they're gonna cry, if they think they're gonna fall, make sure beforehand you go ahead and stop and rest and do it all over again. And the way we explain it is it's just as if you're going to the gym and you're, do, you're with a trainer and you're doing your bicep curls and you're on your third set and you're just like, oh, I only have two more to go, but I just can't do it. I can't do it. I can't do it. And your trainer says, just give me one more. Give me one more. That's <laughs> when those veins are bulging deep down inside. You're growing those muscles. You're growing. You're getting the oxygen to those muscles and you're growing those collateral vessels to improve the blood flow. You have this amazing set of collateral vessels that pretty much lay dormant until you kick them into to action. And it's when your body says, I need more oxygen, give me more nutrients. That's when you're taking that extra step. That is when your body starts dilating those vessels and growing them like tree roots in search of water. Now, secondarily, now you're going to help me with this just in case, right? I'm wrong. But secondarily, what we've learned is that the, the muscles are also actually learning in that process to do without the additional blood flow. You're going to be working with less over time, right? When you're just having the collateral vessels feed them. So your muscles are actually learning in this process that even though they're going to get some blood flow through those collateral vessels, they're never going to get the full blood flow. So they have to learn how to work effectively and efficiently on less. That's very good. I mean, I I feel motivated just listening to you. <laughs> so it was. I love your passion there, and I think that's totally right. I mean, I think the the basic pearls are exactly how you said it, which is, you know, when we get, when someone has chest pain, we don't ask them to walk through chest pain. You know, we say stop. Chest pain can be dangerous, but leg pain. You know, in a, in a patient who doesn't have leg pain at rest, you know, it's safe and important to hit that pain point. Push yourself walk through it if you can, rest as as you need, and then go again. And the only other aspect to it that's important is trying, you know, a big part of the treadmill program is a little bit of elevation uh, mm -hmm. because we know that most patient symptoms come out when they're going up a hill or going up stairs or any type of incline. And so when possible, trying to find some different gradients of incline, whether it's um, a small hill outside or maybe doing a little bit of stairs, um, I think that also really helps build out the collateral, the accessory vessels. And then the other part of it is all of us get older and also to protect our muscle strength, you know, that also helps with the supporting structures. You know, I think that as much of the arterial benefits from exercise is also the support muscles that get stronger and our stability gets stronger. And so we're a more functional walker overall because of the exercise programs, in addition to the benefits of what we call angiogenesis or the collateral vessel development. So all great points, Kim, and, and I completely agree. Uh, are there any vessels, we get this all the time, and we've never gotten a definitive answer from anyone. Are there certain areas, certain blockages in your legs that have the ability to grow collateral vessels better than others? We always hear that the iliacs may struggle, so that's why doctors tend to intervene sooner on those. But it, we've never had a clear answer. Yeah. Depending on the blockages. 
That's a good question. You know, the original exercise trial, so the CLEVER trial, which randomized patients to an exercise program or a stent, and most of them had iliac disease, that was the trial that showed equivalence, that you can do just as well with exercise as a stent and really push the exercise program into the guidelines and into the reimbursement pathway. So I don't think that the iliacs necessarily are the wrong territory. In theory, any vessel any blood vessel should be able to develop angiogenesis or collateral. Mm -hmm. So we see it in the heart all the time as well with chronic blockages. The reason why iliacs, we tend to be a little bit more proactive for stenting is that the stents that go into large vessels like iliac arteries tend to stay open a lot longer than what we do below the waist. So the lower extremities below the waist, those are vessels that tend to really be plagued with repeat stenoses, repeat need for interventions. And that's why as much as we can find other ways to treat people, including exercise programs, um, that it's beneficial. Whereas the iliacs might be a little bit more accommodating to um, staying open with the stent procedures. But but in theory, anything should, should be able to develop collaterals, but we see them most maturely below the waist, like you mentioned in the vessels um, and the legs. You know, what's so interesting is five years ago when we first started, I would you know, guide patients, hey, it's so much easier for these doctors to treat a short focal lesion than when it becomes this long calcified occlusion, the ultimately the, the Achilles heel right there in the SFA. Um, but now, because th there just wasn't, uh, there weren't, didn't seem to be as many doctors that could get through the, the most advanced lesions and those long calcified um, blockages. But now I just feel like, hey, you know what? Don't worry if that that short focal lesion grows because there's so many new tools and techniques and ways in which, you know, doctors can get through if, in fact, it does ever become a problem down the road. But chances are most patients are not with the walking program and all of the lifestyle modifications and compliance with medicines. They're just not progressing, you know, that much to that point. And so I don't know if that's that's really accurate. So I'm encouraging mo them more to say, hey, don't worry about that short focal lesion. Go ahead and just walk, walk, walk. The blockage doesn't matter. It's your symptoms that matter. Yeah, well, um, I totally agree with you. I mean, I think the most important thing in the world is what patients experience. And so everything else doesn't matter to me. It's just about if a patient is having good quality of life, functional limbs, being able to enjoy their day-to-day. -day. And so that needs to be the center of any discussion, always. And Heinz, do you have a question about walking? Okay, go ahead and unmute. Hi, doctor. Thanks for joining and congratulations on the award. With that, um, uh, I know all about the collateral building for the arteries, but uh, how does it affect the veins going back up? You know, like... Uh, I got critical vein insufficiency. So um, does that help? Do you, do you build collateral stuff in your veins also? And yeah. the reason why I ask is that, you know, my SFA and my POP, they're, they're blocked and stents were put in and opened and whatever else. But uh, if you have CVI, does walking do anything for the veins also? Yeah, the veins are a little bit different um, structure. Um, they definitely can form collateral. So we see when people have blocked off veins that they um, they do develop collaterals. But um, I don't know much data about how exercise can help support um, collaterals and venous disease, honestly. So it's a great question. And I think it's probably a little bit understudied. Um, and it would be really interesting to look into. Uh, and, and again, there is the same type of collateral building. I just don't know if it is motivated with exercise like it is for artery. So um, great question. Yeah, that's an interesting question. I hadn't even heard of it or even even thought about that. You know, So that is something to look into going forward. Um, but something else that you've been looking into that I, I find absolutely fascinating, and it's something for me, and I've been criticized by a couple doctors you know, overseas by it, but it's a non-negotiable for me for the use of intravascular ultrasound or what we call IVIS. And you've been a leader in researching the use of it. And based on your research, and I use your research all the time, I just don't understand how more insurance companies aren't supporting it and more doctors are not using it and just relying upon their eye when 
I know from experience, it makes a huge difference, especially in the sizing, the placement, you know, of, of the balloons and, and the stents. And I've seen even an iliac where this, the CT angiogram didn't do it justice. And there was actually a blockage in there with only a, a small percentage of flow. The CT angiogram made it look as though it was, there was still a lot of flow just because of the angle. But Ivis told us a different story because the do doctor said, you know what, I'm going to listen to her symptoms and I'm just going to go in. And that's where we found it. How has this tool, you know, changed clinical practices and improved patient care for those with PAD? What did you learn about it? And based on what you learned, why is there still so much resistance? I, I just don't understand it. Yeah, great comments. And I appreciate you bringing it up because this is definitely one of my other passions. Uh, probably near the top or at the top of my list. And, you know, again, as I mentioned, um, I'm an interventional cardiologist and in the heart attack space, you know, we've had a lot more interest there in recent years because of all the attention. You know, most people know a family member or a famous person who died of a heart attack. So mm -hmm. there's been a lot of development in that space that's outpaced peripheral vascular disease. And in my training in the last, you know, in particular 15 years, um, these new devices have come out that are cameras. They're literally a catheter with a camera on the end. And what we realize is if you take an X-ray of an artery or a CT scan, or we're going in the even the procedure suite and doing the cinematography, that the X-ray is taking the 3D structure and collapsing it into a pancake. And so we think that we get a good idea of the vessel, but we can't see inside it. And we're also completely obligated that the, all the turns and, and bends and whatnot that we can try to make sense of it, even though we're collapsing it into a 2D image. And so in the in the heart arteries, the coronary arteries, when we started looking at these cameras in the arteries, we started seeing all these things that we were shocked by. We'd put in a stent. The stent would look great on the angiogram. We'd go in with this camera and the stent's completely underexpanded or just floating in the vessel or traumatized the wall and caused a dissection and we couldn't see it on the angiogram. And so all the, my era of interventional cardiologists who do coronary interventions realized that we were not doing our patients justice if we relied only on the angiogram. And there are many now dozens of trials that have shown better outcomes if we use these cameras to help guide our procedures than just the angiogram. And so in the, in the coronary space, we have a big movement looking to get more people trained, get more adoption. Everybody finds it appropriate. The guidelines are recommending it. And I'm looking at this tool and I do a coronary stent and then I go to the next case, the next procedure, and I'm doing a leg stent, same arteries, same disease, very similar equipment. And I'm asking myself, why am I not using the best technology for this procedure if I'm using it for the heart? I have a catheter that works. It can show me very important information. When I use it, I do something different because of it. So, you know, we looked at that um, and we said, we need to we need to figure out how to make this a little bit more mainstream and get the word out and build some of the evidence. And some of the problems that happen in the vascular space is the device comes out, but it didn't come out with a lot of great evidence. So then we're stuck trying to build that evidence after the fact. Sometimes it's easier to do it up front for whether it's getting approved or guidelines or whatever. So we, you know, with your, you know, similar to what you do for exercise and everything you do in peripheral vascular space, we looked at this and said, we need to start at the bottom and build up. And so we created this initiative and this, this was a very planned approach over the last seven years. The first thing that we wanted to do was um, remind everyone the value of it. So we've kind of put a compendium document out of it was published in Euro Intervention to walk through all the reasons to use intravascular imaging, all the data that was already out there, how the devices work and whatnot. We said, let's get this out to everyone. And then we said, let's do two more things here. Let's one, um, summarize all the evidence that are there and then create a consensus among doctors about how to use this technology so that we have guidelines to recommend scenarios when and when uh, it's best to use this. And two, let's generate some of the data that is needed. And we can do that in patients who are already receiving these devices. And what we found was that with the physicians that made this consensus document, majority of them thought that IVIS should be used in many of our procedural states, you know, in, in particular when doing work below the knees for saving uh, limb salvage and small vessels where it's hard to see. All the doctors who were doing a lot of cases said this is an important tool. And then we looked at everybody who was getting this um, device out in the real world. All of, Maybe some of you were on this um, in this study as well and don't know it. 
And we looked, compared people who got the imaging catheter and didn't. And we saw that people had less amputations, less um, limb issues, better long-term outcomes if people use the camera to help them with their intervention. And earlier this year, um, at the beginning of the year, we published uh, what is really important to me, which was a multi-societal document. Six societies came together, vascular surgery, interventional radiology, interventional cardiology, vascular medicine. Um, and we created a really high level summary document um, with societal endorsement about the role of intravascular imaging to guide um, you know, our peripheral vascular procedures. And so we've made a lot of great progress um, we've been able to maintain the companies to, to provide reimbursement so that we can continue to use these. Um, we've seen growth, and I'll be presenting at the end of this month some data showing that there's more and more use of these procedures now, these cameras um, during procedures than ever before. Um, but we're still not in the majority. We're still in the minority that are using them. And, and so, as you mentioned, we still have work trying to fill the gap. And some of that's education and training and um, some of that is some uh, ways we can make the technology better, but we're not completely there yet. And I, I get patients every single day. That would be great to actually show what not using IVIS can actually lead to. We had one that ended up with a dissection. The doctor didn't know it, and that resulted in amputation. We have one that had uh, quite a number of tacks deployed that were the wrong size. And this person now is in a revolving door of treatments that is likely going to lead to amputation. And um, we've had a patient, several patients actually with um, with stents deployed in their iliac arteries that were too small that have ended up with aorto bifemoral bypasses not long after. And this is just like one after another after another. And yet I still, I, I, I sit there because I'm not a doctor, so I can't say too much back when doctors... I, I call it doc splining to me that IVIS is absolutely not needed. They don't need it. They've never needed it. And my response is, but how do you know you didn't need it? And how do you know that, that person didn't need an amputation because you didn't use it and you sized the, the, the stent too small yeah, or you dissected exactly. the vessel. And the, and they and the don't thing know. is you don't know. And, and the thing is once a device like a stent goes in, you can't take it out. You know, that's the yeah. misconception is once it's deployed, you're you stuck with it. So you want it to be deployed perfectly, optimally, make it last forever. This is a patient who has an, as we call them, an implant now. And so, you know, if you don't do it the right way, you don't know what you're doing, you don't do enough of them, you're not sizing right, you're in trouble and you're not doing the right thing for your patient, you know? Yep. I, I completely agree. So one of the things that we've been doing is we've been um, educating all of our patients about IVIS and, and it's in our list of questions to ask, do you use IVIS, and we explain why it's important. And so one of the things that we're, our next initiative that we're working on is how do we bring it more to the forefront for patients by using IVIS to educate patients about morphology of the, of the plaque, to educate patients about the complications that might arise during a, a, a procedure and why they want to actually delay procedures as much as they can by walk, walk, walking. So it, it's definitely something we'd want to work with you on um, down Absolutely. the road because we think I love that we we've got two really passionate overlaps here. So it's wonderful. <laughs> oh, we, we could even go into how my dad's life was saved because of IVIS. And I went through seven cardiologists and six of them did not use IVIS. The seventh one used IVIS. And I'm so glad we did because Captain McNicholas, you know, from the military does everything as doctors say. And when he got the message, he needed his first COVID vaccine. This was literally a week after having his LAD cleaned out and his right coronary. And he wow. goes out, he goes and gets the first COVID vaccine. A week later, he gets a notice about needing his shingles vaccine. So he gets that. Then he gets his second COVID vaccine. And then he goes and gets his other shingles. His body just went absolutely crazy. His immune system didn't know which way was up. And was, so he had all kinds of symptoms, fluid around his heart, his lungs, wow. inflammation through the roof. And I got on the, on the zoom call with his cardiologist and I was like, it, it can't be your procedure. I mean, it was contrast fluid, IVUS, balloon, IVUS, 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 IVUS. He dotted his eyes. He crossed his T's with IVUS and we knew it was not that. So we just needed to manage the inflammation from all of his um, compliance. But it, oh. I seriously, and the doctor and we contribute it, um, attribute it to, to the use of IVUS. Why? Um, they didn't go back in and go, wait, what's going on here? 
So I'm a big Thank fan you, of yeah. it and I don't mind, you know, pushing it out there like this. But I do want to go on because I know we only have a few more minutes with you. We could talk Ivis all day long. Um, <laughs> but one of your other significant research contributions highlighted the lack of vascular assessment prior to amputations. Um, what impact do you hope this research will ultimately have on health policy and PAD care? Because I, I fear it's just fallen on, on deaf ears and I don't understand why it hasn't been picked up in mainstream. Yeah, you know, I think we don't, appreciate and this is the biggest part of the cross collaboration among specialties of just how few vascular specialists are out there for how big this disease state is yeah you know and there was a an article published a few years ago that even from vascular surgeons only one third of u.s counties have a vascular surgeon that means the majority of the u.s people live in areas where there's no vascular surgeon and so the first take home from that is why are these doctors you know can get along better when, you know, interventional cardiologists, interventional radiologists can also do this. And that's for another time. Um, but the other part of it that was a reality in, is patients come to the hospital and they come with, you know, advanced concerns with their leg, whether it's rest pain or wounds that are out of control. And if there's not a vascular specialist around there, the real reflex is I need to take the rest of the leg off to save the patient. And I have a buddy who is a trauma surgeon and he moonlights at a hospital in New Hampshire. And he has all these patients coming in with advanced disease and they have no one to send them to. And their only option is to amputate. And so when we thought about this, um, we knew we needed to show these numbers and make sure people understood that this is still happening in current time. And that was really the motivation for the paper was showing that there is a impact of doing a revascularization attempt and it may not be that we could open everything you know we know that there is just stuff that's too advanced and we're developing better techniques for that but um at least give a shot at revascularization because we know when we can revascularize we can usually in the right opportunity to save the leg um and then also we showed that the better the vascular intensity the more more care you get before your amputation if you do need one the better you do after the amputation. So you actually end up with better outcomes if you do unfortunately have to go through an amputation. And so the combination of that just tells you that we need to continue to build out our workforce. Um, we need to build out our limb salvage teams. We need to be able to access patients in all communities, whether it's rural or urban, whether it's in Georgia or Boston. And only by doing so can we optimize care like procedures and angiograms and revascularization um, and get to these patients before they're stuck with a life altering, you know, amputation. How, how did you determine that more than 60% of all PAD related amputations are being performed without a doctor attempting to try and save the leg in the year prior? And then 90% of which are not even offered a vascular evaluation in the year prior. Yeah. Yeah. So what we did for that study is we identified everyone in a year who had a major amputation. So we looked through, again, the same databases before Medigare, and we said, okay, let's identify all patients who've had an amputation, and let's see what happened in the year prior to it. So we went through backwards, and we looked at everybody who had an amputation, and we said, wow, there's people here who are getting a major amputation had zero attempts. And when you're on Medicare, I can find every every procedure done because it's all billed through the same source. So we looked at all those bill codes and we said, no one did anything for this patient except for a major amputation. And that's where we got that number from. And then again, we were able to follow afterwards and say, well, now that they've had an amputation, what happened in the year or two after that? How well did they survive? What type of care did they get? You know, and that that was really the motivation for the work and how we were able to, to get it done was these really nationwide databases that capture all the elements of your, your health care. And what I fear is that you're just looking at Medicare numbers and you haven't looked at Medicare Advantage numbers. Yeah, so we're just starting to get that data. So we now have Medicare Advantage data. It's a little bit behind, so it's about, it's the 2021 now, but we have some data that we worked on that we'll be presenting soon on that. And, you know, there's other it's insurers that we do miss. And, and you know, one of the data, one of the things that we've studied a lot of is if you are on Medicaid and Medicare. So that makes you quite financially vulnerable if you have to be on Medicare and Medicaid. And we look a lot at that marker of mm -hmm. getting good access to care and good outcomes. And, and time and time again, people who are on both Medicaid and Medicare tend to have worse outcomes, whether 
they can't access the right doctors or don't have enough income to take care of themselves in the way that they need to. But um, there's a lot of areas there in Medicaid and, and other served, you know, underserved populations like that are a big interest of mine as well. Yeah. And I, I, the reason I had mentioned is just because we're experiencing so many denials for Medicare Advantage plans right now. And it's oh, just disconcerting. With our Lifesaver hotline, I'm continuing to get calls. I just had one at three o'clock this morning and the patient dialed in twice to get through. And it was like, we spent at least 45 minutes. It was dangling the legs over the side of the bed. It was coaching to get up. It's okay. Start walking, you know, try your foot bicycle. Let's do everything and anything to get that gravity working for you and, and get that circulation. So, you know, she could at least get a few hours of sleep. This is happening over and over again. So that's wow. why I wondered, I imagine there's going to be even uh, uh, an even worse number than what we're yeah. seeing right now with the Medicare numbers. Yeah. Yeah. It's and bad. I can imagine, and I think, you know, the nice thing, you know, the back, you know, 10, 20 years ago, Medicare was not a preferred insurance because they, the reimbursement looked different to the doctor. Not, and this is before my time, but now we love Medicare because for all the pr procedures they're forced to, we're, we don't have to get prior authorization to do them. But the Medicare Advantage has changed that, you know, and that, and you'll see a lot. I see this a lot online, a lot among the operators who are practicing in privately owned clinics like office-based labs that they they're being tortured by their patients who are getting um, transitioned to Medicare Advantage because they can't do the yeah. procedures they need, which were available on medic the traditional Medicare, as we call it, Medicare fee for service. So you're totally spot on about that, and I've seen a lot of those um, denials in recent time. And one big concern is is with those Medicaid patients that you mentioned that I'd love to look at here in California, that there's a big provider that I read 2018 data that was provided to me and slipped anonymously to me. Um, but it was um, 2018 data that showed that this one provider, 80 out of every 100 presentations of PAD were ending up with an, a major amputation. And yet this provider has a first right of refusal for Medicare patients in this state. So that's wow. very concerning to me. So I, I'm I'm looking into that and trying to work with um, some lawmakers um, to raise awareness on that and hoping that we can have an impact there. But I think we had an impact with Humana in the Medicare Advantage um, realm because recently I, I posted a plea to the new CEO, brand new CEO. He's worked through there um, in another position, but brand new CEO in the last few months. And I had a patient that is suffering in a very big way. And I put out a plea and many of their, their employees between Humana and Cohere uh, stalked my profile. And I wow. just had a doctor say that in a patient to patient, that supposedly the policy has changed and restrictions lifted on revascularization um, for patients in CLI and the use of atherectomy. And I'm waiting for confirmation, but if so, I have to give a big shout out to Humana for, for changing their policy and putting patients first now that they've learned that it's an issue. So I'm crossing my fingers. I don't know if you've heard anything to put you on the spot live, but I'm hoping, and, and if so, wow, what humanity and Humana. Yeah. Yeah. I haven't heard anything, but that would be fantastic. And I'll tell you, as much as we complain about the insurance companies, you know, I about a year ago, maybe eight months ago, myself and others, Kumar Matasari, Kush Desai and others, we went in front of Evicor for IVIS and they were not going to cover IVIS anymore. And we gave them um, a whole explanation why we think it's important, kind of how you summarize Kim. And I sent them all the data I talked about. Um, so I had a whole compendium of data that I sent them and guidelines yeah. and, and they came back and they revised their, their documents and they covered IVIS. So, you know, I think they're, I, I wish that the insurance companies spent a little bit more time proactively having these type of interactions with societies. And yeah. I, I'll give a shout out to Sky, S-C-A-I. Um, and they were part of the PA, PAD Alliance, uh, PAD Pulse Alliance that we talked about, but um, they've been really great about advocating for patients and interacting with these um, insurance companies, and they organized this effort with Evicor. And so there is promise there. We just need to get in front of the right people and, and get them yeah. understanding a, a, an alternative perspective than maybe they're hearing from their other, you know, specialty teams and whatnot. So I, I love when they actually, they, they sit down and they listen and they, they, they are willing to, to act. It's, it's amazing. I have two more questions for you. This one, I'm going to end with a softball, but this one, I know it's a little loaded, but 
we have been doing interviews over the past month with doctor after doctor after doctor. We had more than 40 interviews in the month of September alone for as part of the Global PAD Impact Awards. And one of the things I kept hearing over and over again was there is, still is not enough evidence when it comes to atherectomy in terms of which device stands out over another device. And it's a real point of contention. And I'm wondering if that's potentially an area of interest or if you see um, any researchers working on that going forward. I know it's a tough thing to try and 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 put you know put one against the other in a in a study. There's a lot that goes into it, but it seems like something that that might be important as we go forward with where we're at. Yeah, you know that that one's a uh, you know as you know there's a lot behind the atherectomy story. You know we know that there is a little bit of a tendency to use these devices maybe more frequently in the outpatient setting than in the hospital setting, but. The more important thing is that most people who do any type of challenging limb salvage work need these devices, you know, and again, we won't debate how often they need them, but I do think that they're important for any um, lower extremity uh, provider who's doing high level care. And so um, we, there's, there is efforts to go into this work. It's again, there's a lot in this answer because um, the companies who make these devices don't have the same incentives to um, put money into these trials once they're already on the market. And that's the challenge, but we have an effort and at Viva this year, we're going to be presenting um, the largest um, meta-analysis of all the trials out there that have already looked at these devices. And we're looking at randomized trials, observational studies. There's hundreds of papers that we went through that will be part of this wow. analysis. And we'll share some um, outcome data and maybe some perspectives on moving forward. So this is an effort that definitely we're, we're thinking about um, again, it's not about, to me, it's not about, do you use this all the time or, or only some of the time? It's more that the doctors have access to the technology that they think is important to do the procedure for their patient. And so um, my goal is to allow for that access and then that us figure out what the right use is after that. And um, so we're hoping to make a little bit of progress with this um, report at Viva and I'll make sure to follow up with you and, and others once that's uh, not you know newly public. See, I love this. And if anyone just joined in and even wonders why he is the vascular luminary of the year, here I did. I didn't even know that he was working on this. And it's one of the, the biggest points of contention out there. And what we kept hearing over and over again is evidence, evidence, evidence. We need evidence for this. And here he is. He has evidence that's going to be presented um, at the end of the month or into the first week of November. And we'll, of course, bring it to everyone as soon as uh, we get that announcement. So, Dr. Zizemski, you're amazing. So looking ahead, you know, what are some of the other key challenges and opportunities that you see in the field of PAD research and, and treatment that you just can't wait to sink your teeth into? Well, I'll say, I think there's a lot of fun stuff coming in the uh, technology world. We're doing a lot of clinical trials on new devices, drug-coated balloons, new absorbable stents, other ways to try to make the interventions in our legs safer and more durable. But my most important passion moving in the next couple of years is, um, as you uh, kindly mentioned at the beginning, is trying to just get all these different doctors talking and working together. You know, I think I try my best to uh, not look at your you know, background as a, a surgeon or interventional cardiologist or radiologist, but so how do we all come together, build this out together, get our country up to speed in terms of vascular care and and we can generate the data together. We can generate the guidelines together. We can um, team up and work together. And so, you know, Dr. Dua is a great friend of mine and is a great, um, you know, leader and and thinker and and really a role model in this space. And we need more people like her. And we will continue really to invest in that. So I think if I can add anything to this space in the near future, it'd be to continue to build those cross collaborative opportunities and. Uh, really protect our patients. Well, congratulations, Dr. Eric Szemski. He is our amazing Global PAD Impact Award winner for the Vascular Luminary of the Year Award. Well-deserved, and we can't wait to see what more you do in the years to come. Thank you, Kim, and thank you, everyone. I really appreciate it.